Well, hello everyone. My name is Neil Andrews and I am editor of the Pain Research Forum. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Exercise Induced Pain and Analgesia, Role of the Innate Immune System, to be presented by Dr. Kathleen Suka. Today's webinar is actually PRF's 23rd webinar overall and we're really excited about today's event, which is our first on the topic of exercise and pain. In terms of format, uh, Dr. Sluka will present a talk that will last about a half hour. After the talk, each of our panelists will take a couple of minutes to make a comment on the presentation uh, and or raise some questions and then the rest of the time will be devoted to group panel discussion and audience questions. Speaking of which, we encourage everyone in the audience to submit your questions. You can do that at any time. You can do it now, during the talk, after the talk. Uh, just by typing your questions into the questions area of your control panel window. A uh, quick note about audio, if you're having any trouble hearing, if you're using your computer, make sure the volume is turned up. Um, if you're still having trouble, you can switch to using the phone. And if you're having trouble with the phone, you can try using your computer for the audio. Usually switching from one to the other will fix um, any problems that you might have. So uh, let's get going. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Catherine Bushnell. Dr. Bushnell is Scientific Director of the Division of Intramural Research at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health in Bethesda. Catherine, welcome to the webinar. It's great to have you here today. Please go ahead. Thank you, Neil. It's really great to be here today and to be able to introduce Kathleen. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Um, uh, one is, is Marie Vermont, who is Associate Professor at Marquette University in Milwaukee, uh, Illinois in the United States, and the other panelist is Peter Grace, who is an assistant professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Uh, so um, the panelists uh, will, will make some comments and questions along with the rest of the audience, and so I hope everybody participates as much as possible. Um, uh, so our, as, as Neil said, our presenter today is Dr. Kathleen Sluka. Uh, she's professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science at the University of Iowa. Um, I've known Kathleen for many years and admired her work. She's a physical therapy, she, she got a physical therapy degree at Georgia State University and then she got a PhD in anatomy from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. She then, then did postdoctoral fellowship work with Dr. Bill Willis at, uh, in, in Galveston, and she joined the faculty at the University of Iowa after that. So uh, Dr. Sluka's research focuses on the neurobiology of musculoskeletal pain, as well as the mechanisms and effectiveness of non-pharmacological pain treatments commonly used by physical therapists. So we're delighted to have Kathleen here today, and as Neil said, her talk will be, is entitled Exercise-Induced Pain and Analgesia, Role of the Innate Immune System. Okay, Kathleen, can you please go ahead? Thank you, Kathleen. I um, want to thank Neil for inviting me to do this. I, this is my second talk I've ever given in my office, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, and I, but this is kind of an exciting area that uh, we've recently started investigating. Uh, and I wanted, before we start, to just thank the people who participated in these studies. And that's a picture of my lab. And this is the group of people who have participated in different aspects of the study. It's never done alone. Uh, and all of these people have contributed significantly to various different aspects, um, from students to postdocs, visiting scientists, and, and uh, just laboratory technicians in my, in my lab. I have a couple disclosures, although none of them have anything to do with exercise-induced analgesia. There's not a huge money-making event for that. Um, so, however, it is quite effective. So I wanted to go over and talk a little bit about physical activity versus physical inactivity before we get started. So physical inactivity, as most of you already know, is a big health concern in the United States. And let me just show you this little graph from the CDC. This is the percent of people that meet the CDC requirements for regular physical activity by state. Um, so you can pick your state. Look where you are on the list. I can tell you my state here, which is Iowa, is pretty low on the list of meeting physical activity requirements. If you happen to live in California or Alaska, you're pretty active compared to the rest of the United States. But even that, it's not huge. 
So that's a huge problem. And physical inactivity is a problem because it actually increases the risk for development of chronic musculoskeletal pain. So a large study called the Hunt study, which was done in Norway uh, based on a database where they uh, have socialized medicine, they can get all this information on large populations of people. And they essentially showed that there was an increased risk for development of chronic musculoskeletal pain for those people who were inactive. And that was really defined as people who spent less than one hour per week in their uh, exercise activities or recreational activities. And that risk just goes down as you increase your activity levels. The other big problem is that people with chronic pain are actually physically inactive. So Dane Cook's lab uh, has shown that physical fibromyalgia patients spend more time sitting and less time walking. There's a, there's a nice systematic review that shows that chronic low back pain patients are more sedentary than age match controls. And we've shown the same thing in osteoarthritic patients. And what we actually were able to show with um, using a pedometer was that the amount of activity is not different at lower walking, so the, the cadence. And this is the uh, amount of steps taken at each of these different cadences. Where people fall off is in the higher levels of activity. So they're still doing low level, light level physical activities, but they're stopping doing more higher levels of activity and more vigorous activity. So we, Bente Peterson in Copenhagen had come up with this uh, disease zone of physical inactivity. And it really suggests that physical inactivity is an abnormal state of the body. And it puts you at risk for a number of different things. And you can see them all here, cancer, dementia, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And we kind of knew all of that. Um, she doesn't talk about pain, so I ma we made her disease on a physical activity and put pain on there because it also puts you at risk for development of chronic pain. All right, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Everybody on here is a pain specialist and knows that chronic pain is a big problem. Um, and chronic musculoskeletal pain is probably the most common type of chronic pain condition. One of the big problems with people with chronic musculoskeletal pain is that movement, activity, or exercise increases the pain. People with chronic musculoskeletal pain also have a significant amount of fatigue. That includes muscle fatigue or physical fatigue. And there's reports of up to 100% of subjects showing this. Almost all of our fibromyalgia patients that we use in some of our studies actually report fatigue. And in fact, a single bout of fatiguing exercise can increase pain in people with fibromyalgia. So I wanted to show you how much that actually is. So we took fibromyalgia patients, we compared them to healthy controls, and we had them do this fatiguing exercise. And they took these little shapes here on the bottom and moved them from the bottom to the top and back to the middle. It takes about 12 minutes, and it produces a significant amount of physical fatigue. We also asked them to do a cognitive fatiguing task where they had to give you as many words that began with each of these letters in a given time frame. And we made that time frame equivalent of another 12 minutes or so at, to the physical fatiguing task. And then we asked them to rate their pain levels. And this is a different score. And you can see that the cognitive fatigue task increased the pain levels by about one. The physical fatigue test increased the pain levels by about three. So if you, and there weren't any significant changes in the healthy controls. So if you're taking someone with fibromyalgia, their average pain rating is a four or five. And we're increasing their pain levels by three by asking them to do a simple 12-minute fatiguing exercise. That means we took them from a four or five to a seven or an eight. We took them from a moderate level of pain to a severe level of pain. So that's significant, and that is one of the main reasons why they don't perform regular physical activity. This is the amount of fatigue that, was that people um, reported during these tasks. 
So during the physical fatigue test, they both got increases in cognitive fatigue as well as physical fatigue. And during the cognitive fatigue task, both, both healthy and fibromyalgia got increases in cognitive fatigue. But interestingly, the fibro patients also got interest, increases in physical fatigue. So this isn't just a localized physical fatigue. There's a lot of overlap. And so when you're thinking about this from a clinical perspective, I think about the physical, if you can, if you're increasing their cognitive fatigue and then asking them to remember and do a lot of tasks, they're not going to remember it as well. So what we really wanted to know was to really look at mechanisms. So I'm going to tell you and use a couple of different animal models here today, and I'm just going to tell you about them first so that uh, we don't have to go through them each time. But the first animal model is one we developed a number of years ago where we give two injections of acidic saline into the gastrocnemius muscle. We do those five days apart. And then they develop a long-lasting hyperalgesia without overt tissue damage. We decided to develop a model of kind of this fatiguing exercise-induced pain as well. And so we tweaked our pH4 model, and we changed some parameters a little bit. We gave two injections of pH5 saline instead of 4. But we combined that with an electrically induced fatiguing stimulus of the muscle that was being injected. And this is an isometric contraction. The little graph here shows the amount of force, maximum force you get before you do a fatiguing task. This is during the fatiguing stimulation. And this is the amount of force after. So they're getting, the muscle is getting fatigued. And then we tested withdrawal thresholds of the muscle, and we also test uh, withdrawal responses of the heart. So what I'll show you is this is kind of what we're looking at when you look at the muscle. There's a baseline force. The two injections of pH 5 alone don't do anything. The two injections of pH 7.2 are, I'm sorry, the pH 7.2 with the stimulation doesn't really change the withdrawal threshold. When you combine them, you get this decrease in withdrawal threshold. And that's similar uh, decrease that you would get with the pH 4, pH 4 injection. So that's generally the models we're going to talk about today. So we were doing some reading. We decided we wanted to know how could fatiguing exercise tasks produce pain. So we thought that peripheral mechanisms such as release of fatigue metabolites could be released in sensitized nociceptors. We know that muscle fatigue releases things like ATP and lactate and decreases pH. We know that there's ATP receptors and ASICs that would act, be activated by lactate and protons on the nociceptors. And we know that activation of those can produce pain. So we just tested at the level of the muscle is if we gave these substances, ATP, lactate, pH 6, or the combination of all of them, whether or not we would get a change in withdrawal threshold at the muscle. And so what you can see is that any of those substances given alone didn't really change the withdrawal thresholds. But when we gave them all three in combination, we get this nice decrease in withdrawal threshold in response to the stimulation that lasts for a couple of hours. So this is a couple of hours. These substances are pre cleared fairly quickly from the muscle. So we then asked whether or not the ACE what channels would be involved in this process. So our first thought was that acid-sensing ion channels they would be involved, and we've previously shown data that A63 had a role in our chronic muscle pain model, as well as an inflammatory pain model in the muscle. And so we took A63 knockout mice, A61 knockout mice, and compared them to wild-type uh, mice. And you can see the A63 knockout mice don't develop the hyperalgesia, the ASIC ones and the wild types, of course, still do. We then, that, you know, doesn't really tell us where the ASIC channel is because it's a full body knockout. So we next asked if we blocked ASIC3 in the muscle, could we prevent the hyperalgesia from developing? So we gave an ASIC3 antagonist, APET times 2, X2, I don't even know how to say that one. Um, we gave this directly into the muscle, and you can see a nice dose-dependent 
blockade of the development of the hyperalgesia. Now, we give this right before the fatiguing stimulus, so it would be blocking the effects of the muscle fatigue. Okay, that tells us that it's at the level of the muscle, but we don't know where in the muscle that is occurring. We hypothesized, of course, that that would be occurring at the level of the nociceptor. And so using a viral construct that we previously characterized, um, which this is an HSC virus that expresses microRNA to A63. So it's only picked up and, and works in the DRG. So it only knocked down A63 in primary afferent fibers. And we previously showed this in, in another paper. So we just injected this construct into the muscle and it had no effect on our development of hyperalgesia. Both groups still got equally hyperalgesic. So obviously our hypothesis was wrong. So we came up with a new hypothesis. And it turns out that within the muscle, there's a number of resident macrophages that just sit there and police the microenvironment. And, and that's normal. Every tissue has macrophages that sit in their tissues to police the microenvironment. And so we hypothesized that the macrophages were playing a role in this hyperalgesia. So I'm just going to show you some pictures. All these little green dots on the screen you see here, these are macrophages stained for F480. And all of this is the muscle tissue itself. And you can see that they're kind of lightly distributed throughout the muscle, but they're not, there's not a ton of them. So we asked what happens in our chronic muscle pain model to the number of macrophages. And you can see kind of here that there's an increase. We injected IL-6. You can see some more. We injected lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, and again, a greater increase. So if we actually quantify, that's just showing that they're in the muscle. If you quantify the number in the exercise-induced pain model, you can see a nice increase of macrophages with the electrical stimulation or the fatiguing task. In the, we then asked if we take out the macrophages, and we did this by injecting clodronic microso uh, liposomes into the muscle, and that will kill off local macrophages. And when we do that, the hyperalgesia doesn't develop. So that's the red bar here. Same thing happens in our chronic muscle pain model with the two pH4 injections. There's an increase in the number of macrophages that is prevented by clodronate, and the hyperalgesia is prevented in the animals that received a depletion of the macrophages. So I want to point out here, if you look, I'm pointing to my screen, if you, if, I'll point out here that if you look at this increase in macrophages, it's not huge. If I were to inject carrageenan or CFA, for instance, into the muscle, you'd be in the 1,000 range. So we're looking at a very small increase. Um, and whether or not this is an infiltration or it happens to be uh, from a local self-proliferation, we don't know yet. But, but it isn't a huge increase. But it is enough, apparently, to have an effect. So we next asked um, whether or not any of these fatigue metabolites could induce release of inflammatory cytokines. So again, our hypothesis here, let's go here, is that sedentary animals during a fatiguing task release these fatigue metabolites, which activate receptors on the macrophages. And that activation releases inflammatory cytokines to produce activate nociceptors and produce pain. And so we took cultured macrophages from the peritoneum and we incubated them with pH 6 or with LPS as a control. So LPS uh, activates toll receptors, specifically on immune cells, and so it's a nice immune cell activator, just kind of a standard activator of macrophages. And so you can see a nice increase in IL-6, interferon gamma, IL-1 beta, and TNF with uh, both pH-6 and with LPS, suggesting that at least they're being activated and releasing inflammatory cytokines. So in our, we next asked if we activated macrophages in vivo 
could we mimic the effects of the repeated acid injections. So that's exactly what we did. We replaced one of the acid injections, either the first or the second one with LPS. They both did the same thing, so I'm only going to show you one of those data. But you can see that when I replace one of the acid injections with LPS, I can get a dose-dependent hyperalgesia that will also produce a contralateral hyperalgesia. And we then went in and blocked toll receptors in the muscle pharmacologically. And when we do that, we can also prevent the development of the hyperalgesia. Again, all of this supports the role that macrophages are playing. So, so because macrophages are known to express P2X receptors, and in particular P2X4 and 7 are quite known to be on immune cells, we asked whether or not we blocked P2X4 receptors, could we prevent the hyperalgesia? So again, pharmacologically, we blocked the P2X4 receptors. And I'm showing you both males and females here because there, there is a sex difference in the fatigue-induced model, but there's not, not so much in, in our mechanism so far. So blockade of P2X4 receptors prevents the hyperalgesia in both males and females. Again, P this is F480 in the muscle, and you can see a number of macrophages that are labeled for F480. They're also labeled for P2X4. If you count those, you can see under normal conditions, about 40% of the macrophages are labeled for P2X4, and that about doubles after the fatigue-induced pain model at 24 hours. So there's an increase in P2X4. So it still doesn't tell me that it's the macrophages, and that's where they're expressed. So we developed uh, another viral vector when this is a lentivirus with a CD68 promoter in it. The CD68 promoter was linked to a microRNA against P2X4. So this would only be expressed in macrophages. And so we, we wanted to show the specificity of this. To do that, we took our cultured macrophages, we incubated them with the virus, and we looked uh, using PCR for expression of P2X3, 4, 5, and 7. And you can see that only P2X4 is knocked down with this particular construct. When we inject that into the muscle, the animals that get the control virus, they still develop hyperalgesia. The animals that get the microRNA to P2X4 do not develop the hyperalgesia. So again, suggesting that P2X4 on macrophages is important in the development of the hyperalgesia. All right, so that's kind of summarizing what we're saying. We're saying in the exercise-induced pain model, we're getting an increase, activation, increase in the number of macrophages, increased activation of macrophages that may involve P2X4 and A6 that release pro-inflammatory cytokines to activate nociceptors. Now, I haven't tested every part of the pathway yet, but that's probably coming. So next, um, on the other side, that's an acute bout of exercise. All of those studies were done in sedentary animals. In fact, most basic science studies are done in sedentary animals. They're not done in people who are physically act in animals that are physically active. We also know that regular physical activity and regular exercise prevents pain. I showed you that already. And it's an effective treatment for people with chronic musculoskeletal pain, as well as neuropathic pain, and maybe even headache. Again, you've seen this. Physical activity actually decreases the risk for development of chronic pain. And so knowing that, we, again, needed to develop some animal models to test this. So what we did is we took animals. We wanted them to be physically active, but we didn't want to have a lot of stress. Treadmill running can produce stress. Other forms of swimming is somewhat stressful to the animals. So we decided to put running wheels in their cages, and we compared them to our, our sedentary mice. So each animal is housed separately. We gave these, them access to these running wheels prior to induction of the muscle insult. At the time of the muscle insult, we take the running wheels out of the cage, and, and then we look and see what happens to development of chronic pain. So in our chronic muscle pain model, you can see that here's the two injections of acidic saline. The red is the sedentary animals, a nice increase in 
response frequency of the paw to, to mechanical stimulation. And if you do eight weeks of exercise, that prevents that. But it doesn't last forever. The effects are temporary. So it's, it's only uh, producing a partial short-term reduction, which just means that you can't exercise once in your life for six weeks and expect it to have a long-term lifetime effect. In our fatigue-induced pain model, similarly, we get this prevention of the development of the hyperalgesia with eight weeks of running wheel activity. And so it looks like eight weeks, in some cases five days, shorter durations also have an effect. So we made this hypothesis that there was a difference. There's two types of macrophages. There's really about a million types of macrophages. There's a continuum from M1s to M2s. But we really are going to talk about the two extremes. The M1s are release inflammatory cytokines. The M2s release anti-inflammatory cytokines. And so if there's more M1s, we would expect more inflammatory cytokines and more pain. If there's more M2s, they would release more anti-inflammatory cytokines, which can reduce nociceptor activity. And the macrophage phenotype is actually regulated by the microenvironment. So one of the things that is released, one of these fatigue metabolites, ATP, is well known to produce a phenotypic switch from an M1 to an M2. So regular exercise may actually switch the phenotype. So we tested that by looking at the number of macrophages in sedentary versus physically active mice after eight weeks. So this is the muscle again. Here's your macrophages stain for F480. We used a M2 marker CD206, and that's here in red. And then we looked for the number of co-labeled cells. So somebody went in and counted all of those and came and showed that we had an increase in the total number or the percent of M2 macrophages in physically active mice. They didn't change the total number of macrophages, just an increase in the percentage of M2s when compared to sedentary animals. So since M2s release IL-10, we asked whether or not IL-10 was involved in this process. So we first just gave an IL-10 receptor block antibody systemically. And again, I'll point out the big points here, but this is the ipsilateral, the contralateral side. And remember, it's a bilateral hyperalgesia. So if you look here, if the sedentary animals are getting hyperalgesic in yellow. The exercised animals are getting analgesic. That's in blue. And the exercised animals who got the IL-10 receptor antibody do not have that analgesia. So the IL-10 receptor seems to be involved, and IL-10 appears to be involved in this process. We then gave it into the muscle, and when we give it into the muscle, right before the second injection of acid saline, you can see that we prevent the analgesia of regular exercise as well. But we only, only prevent it in the muscle that's injected. The contralateral side is still analgesic. So it's a local effect at the level of the muscle. We then asked whether or not IL-10 could mimic the effects of regular exercise. So we took our sedentary animals and we gave them IL-10 for, depending on whether we gave it systemically or locally, for either five to ten days. And when we did that, IL-10 long-term delivery actually prevented the development of the hyperalgesia, again, mimicking the effects of regular physical activity. All right. I wanted to briefly touch on some studies we did on neuropathic pain uh, with Fran Bobinski, who was a student visiting the laboratory for uh, about a year. And she had previously shown that animals that regularly exercise have le and receive a nerve injury, she uses a crush injury, they have less tissue damage. So if you can look at the top ones, you can see that the exercised animals um, seem to have better myelin, they seem to have better structure when compared 
to the sedentary animals, and this is the normal animals. In addition to that, and I'm only showing you this, the IL-1 beta, but she shows this in multiple inflammatory cytokines, the exercised animals have less inflammatory cytokines. So she's using a treadmill running protocol, and she's done it three different ways. Either you do it two weeks before the injury, two weeks right after the injury, or before and after the injury, and essentially she gets the same effects. This also happens in people. There's an increase in innervation in people with diabetic neuropathy. Um, this is from uh, Cluding down at, in Kansas, and you can see that he has also sees this increase in innervation in the epidermis. So we asked, did the regular exercise reverse or prevent the development of neuropathic pain? So in these animals, we measured the paw sensitivity of repeated acid injections, we measured an escape avoidance response, and we measured activity levels using an open field test. And you can see that this is the increased responsibility you get in the responsive, increased number of responses to repeated mechanical stimuli you get in the nerve-injured animals. In the exercised nerve-injured animals, that doesn't occur. In, there's an increase in escape avoidance behavior in the neuropathic animals. The exercised animals, that reverses. So in this case, she's starting the exercise. We're doing it post-treatment. The treadmill running 30 minutes, 10 meters per minute, is started three days after injury. You see you start to get that effect. And then lastly, we, get, we, can re, we see a decrease in activity and spontaneous activity in neuropathic animals that's prevented or reversed by treadmill running. So, oh look, I put stuff on it. All right, so we then asked what happened to the phenotype of macrophages at the l level of the nerve injury. So indeed, there's an infiltration of macrophages. There are more macrophages in the, in the injured nerve. And we looked at the differences between M1s and M2s. In sedentary animals, about 60% of them are M1s. And that goes down significantly in exercised animals. And it's almost the same as sham. Again, there's less M2s in sedentary animals and more M2s in exercised animals. And in this case, we were kind of interested in IL-4 because IL-4 is a healing inflammatory cytokine or anti-inflammatory cytokine that is particularly involved in healing process. So we then asked whether or not there were changes in IL-4 in the sciatic nerve. And indeed, you can see in sedentary animals, there's decreases in IL-4. There's also decreases in the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-1-RA. And those are, are reversed in, the, in animals that have performed two weeks of treadmill running. So we then looked at what happens in IL-4 knockout animals. And so to see whether or not that was really involved in the analgesia. And you can see the IL-4 knockouts, and that's this funky group with two colors. Um, and they're still getting hyperalgesic compared to our exercised animals down here. So IL-4 knockout animals are not getting the analgesia with treadmill running, again, suggesting IL-4 is involved in the process. And lastly, we just asked what happens in the exercised animals if we give an IL-4 antibody. And again, giving an antibody to IL-4 reverses the effects, the analgesic effects. So here's where the antibody is given to an exercise group. They start to get hyperalgesic. The antibody wears off, comes back down. You give it again, they start to get analgesic. So again, IL-4 is mediating that effect. And lastly, I can tell you that in the IL-4 exercise mice, that change in phenotype doesn't occur, suggesting IL-4 is actually involved in the process of driving the phenotype from an M1 to an M2. So I'm on my last data slide, so hang, hang with me now. 
Um, the last thing I wanted to highlight was some data, um, mostly from Peter Grace's uh, work, and he can talk about more of it later. But there is also this similar kind of pattern in the central nervous system, and so I've termed it central immune modulation. Um, and this is from Fran's data, but again, she sees a similar decrease in IL-4 in sedentary animals in the spinal cord, and exercise reverses that. And again, that was treadmill running. Peter nicely did um, voluntary running wheels, just like we did um, six weeks before he induced the neuropathic model. And when he did that, the exercised animals do not get hyperalgesic. It's certainly attenuated and compared to the shams. He then went on to look at a number of things, and I'm only going to show you a few because there's a ton of data in this paper. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, but it, what I will show you is that he looked at day three and day 14 after the nerve injury, and he sees an increase in IL-1 beta on day 14, reversed in the exercise the animals, a decrease in the glutamate transporter, and this is all in the dorsal horn, that's reversed by exercise. And again, I'm highlighting the P2X4 receptor changes. He's seeing an increase in P2X4 receptor in the spinal cord. Again, that's reversed by exercise. So all of this is suggesting that there's some parallel systems in the central nervous system that are also occurring in the, in the peripheral nervous system. So we talk a lot about balance between inhibition and excitation in the central nervous system and descending facilitation, descending inhibition. I'm going to propose that we have the same darn thing happening in the, in the immune system. There's a loss of it. In, in our pain conditions, we seem to have a loss of inhibition. We have less M2s. We have more M1s. And we have the person in a more inflammatory state or easier to activate. Exercise seems to modulate that and balance it back out so that uh, we can increase the number of M2s and reduce some of the uh, M1s. So again, this is for the muscle, and this is my little graphic for the muscle. I could just as easily put nerve injury here or inflammation perhaps at this level or even the spinal cord. But what I'm suggesting is that this muscle injuries, releasing substances like fatigue metabolites that activate receptors on macrophages. If there's more M1s in the state of the animal, then we get pain. If there's more M2s, we'll get analgesia. And it's really a balance between the M1s and the M2s that sets us up uh, to decide whether or not an exercising task is going to be analgesic or it's going to be hyperalgesic. And there are just some potential key players involved in that process I listed here. So with that, I think I will end and say thank you to you all for listening. And I think we have a lot of time for questions. Thank you, Kathleen. That was a superb talk. And I'm sure hopefully there will be lots of questions. There are already a number of them coming in. So while people are, are typing in their questions, maybe we could just start with the panelists, with Marie and Peter, and see if you do have some comments that you'd like to add or some questions you'd like to start with. And then I can start reading off questions from the audience. Sure, this is Marie, and I can start off. Um, first of all, Kathleen, that was great. Um, what I'd highlight as a physical therapist is how nicely this data translates to the clinic. Um, I know a lot of times as a physical therapist and, and talking with other clinicians and, and even pain patients that they seem to have this increase in pain with exercise. Uh, and I think it's really important because even in the literature, sometimes people will say you should avoid all pain with exercise or you, if you have an increase in pain with exercise, you shouldn't, or you shouldn't be exercising. And I think this nicely highlights how we need to educate our patients and really promote exercise progression and how with that increase in physical activity. And as you continue to exercise, rather than an increase in pain, you actually can see um, analgesia. So uh, again, even just taking a step back, if you do have pain with exercise, as Kathleen pointed out, there's this emphasis even on non-pharmacological pain management and that there's a lot you can do both through patient education 
um, even talking about the immune system and that role to help explain what is going on and the importance of regular exercise and um, even some of the, the tools that we have, such as the TENS unit. I know Kathleen has nicely shown that TENS in particular is beneficial work with pain with movement. So again, I just really think this nicely translates to what we're seeing in the clinic um, and really helps to explain how you can have that initial increase in pain, but with over time you actually see a decrease in pain. So again, a really nice translation to, see, to seeing um, some of our clinical outcomes. P Peter, and, uh, do you have a... Yeah, so uh, thanks Kathleen, that was a lovely talk. Um, I think the contrast between the pro and anti nociceptive um, um, consequences due to the fatigue metabolites is very interesting. Um, because the consequences of the muscle activity have um, you know, uh, can have these implications for pain, um, depending on the activity itself. And you're also showing that one can override the effects of the other. So the um, the running wheel uh, activity can actually um, uh, reverse the effects of the fatiguing exercise on pain. So I think that that suggests then that uh, perhaps too much exercise is not a good thing. If you're exercising to exhaustion, then that um, um, uh, could actually lead to uh, enhanced pain, and so you know I'm wondering then what um, what this uh, research means for human health, um, and whether we can use this animal work to devise guidelines, uh, perhaps. So you know how much exercise um, should people be doing? I think the question is always going to be how little do I need to do to um, to get the benefits uh, for pain, and then what types of exercise? Whether you know the aerobic component is important. Um, versus something like weightlifting. And I think there's already so many good reasons to exercise um, for cardiovascular health, for mental health, um, and yet, as you showed earlier, um, getting people to actually do that is really difficult. So just adding in uh, the idea that you can prevent or manage your chronic pain um, with exercise is probably unlikely to be the motivator that's going to get people off the couch and out the door. Um, so what do we do with that? And uh, I wonder, um, are you leaning towards um, trying to put exercise in a pill? Um, you show that you can recapitulate the effects of the exercise with IL-10. So is that a way forward? Um, or are we going to push for um, public health policy here, yeah, or both? That's a really good point. I really would not advocate for putting exercise in a pill, but um, there may be some instances in when tapping into those analgesic mechanisms that we already know are working would be useful, particularly if it takes a couple of weeks to get exercise moved from being painful to being analgesic, maybe just treating them for a couple of weeks with a treatment to reduce that exercise-induced pain and flip it into an exercise-induced analgesia, maybe that would be it. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's the biggest, hardest thing is to get people to adhere to an exercise program. In people with pain, the number one reason they don't adhere is pain with the activity. But there's a number of other reasons why people don't continue. It's just hard to work it into your lifestyle. So uh, we kind of need some public health policy changes. I think that's happening. Everybody's got a Fitbit now, and they pay attention a little bit more. So maybe over time, your society will see a change. It's just difficult. We work too many hours a week to be able to go out and exercise for an hour or two a day. So it makes it really hard. So you're right, Peter. Long ways to go. Mm -hmm. so, so Kathleen, in, in those terms, there seems to be a, several question here, questions here are from people, from looks like from clinicians who are asking, uh, you know, when should people start exercising? Uh, how, how long should they exercise? How should they be counseling their patients? When they have pain and they exercise, they say, well, it's increasing my pain. Do you tell them to persist? Or is there, do you, are there, do you have any, any ideas that, that, that would help guide the clinicians uh, in working with the patients? So I think Marie has lots of ideas about this too. But, um, and so I'll let her comment as well. But, but really, you've got to um, progress them slowly. You've got to treat their pain with exercise. You don't want to take them to a point. Oh, I'm getting some significant noise. You don't want to take them to a point in which their pain um, increases by three points. So you need to give them some guidelines. 
and you need to have them be aware of that. I expect that their pain might increase a little bit with exercise, but you don't want them to increase, say, more than a point on a VAS with the exercise task, and certainly not for hours and hours or days. But you might expect a couple of hours increase immediately after the exercise. So have it, teaching them and educating them on those very specific points. But I'm actually going to let Marie handle this because she's much better at this part of the human studies than I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I do agree with Kathleen, and, and I think a lot of this is actually unknown. Um, I think Peter also addressed this in that uh, we don't know optimal exercise dose at all for pain management. Um, you know, early on we had a focus on aerobic exercise, say with like fibromyalgia, and there was a lot of research, and there was this focus on aerobic exercise, and then some of the research started coming out and say, well, hey, strengthening is also beneficial. And, and right now, whether aerobic or strengthening is more beneficial for different types of pain conditions um, really is not known. And I think Kathleen also nicely highlighted the role of sedentary behavior. Um, I've noticed recently, even with some Cochrane reviews, where they focus solely on walking. How if you increase your walking, um, which really is a low intensity, obviously exercise type program, you can have some nice benefits, specifically with musculoskeletal pain. Um, so I, I think it's really difficult. There is, um, Kelly Noggle did a nice uh, meta-analytical review showing um, that the exercise dose is not known. Um, it's obviously a lot more variable for chronic pain patients, but it does appear that moderate and higher intensity will exacerbate your pain, which again, I think Kathleen nicely highlighted with some of that fatigue work. Um, but again, it, it's really not known what is the most optimal exercise dose. I think if we also take a step back, a lot of people are, are deconditioned, um, and then also depending on the age range, so again, back to fibromyalgia, some of them are older, um, and we have to realize what are we prescribing the exercise for? Is it obviously for pain management, but are there other things that we have to be aware of? Um, with the deconditioning, we also want to increase their physical fitness. So what else can we do? Um, with aging, we know that you definitely lose muscle mass, and, th and that's a problem. So uh, obviously, it's a very individualized um, type of progression, and um, a lot of other factors come into play. So unfortunately, I don't have those answers. Um, Kathleen put me on the spot there. Um, <laughs> and uh, that is definitely something that we're interested in, but I am very hesitant when people say, oh, exercise makes my pain worse. Um, I, I can't exercise. Uh, and then, you know, I always challenge my physical therapy students. So when you're even in the clinic, what do you do? And like, well, we just tell them not to exercise or, or slow down. And I think that's there's certain validity there, but I also think, again, we have so many tools. Kathleen highlighted the patient education. Um, you can talk about, uh, you know, perhaps an ice pack. You can talk about stretching. You can talk about progression. So there's a lot we can do as clinicians to help address um, some of that increase in pain. And obviously, like Kathleen pointed out, you know, if they're going from a 2 to, say, like an 8 out of 10, that would not be appropriate. Um, but I always tell my patients, especially when you first start out, um, expect a slight increase in pain. That, that's how I talk to them about it. And then if they don't have it, like, wow, I'm actually doing well and I'm really tolerating it well. So, again, I think a lot of it is what we tell our patients, their expectations, um, and honestly how we sell the exercise. Um, and not just the benefits with pain, but the benefits overall. Marie, this is Catherine Bushnell. Um, in, in working with your patients, do you talk to them about the things that they might like? You know, because the cognitive effects on um, all of this. So if you do something that you hate, uh, you're not going to do it. If you do something you like, you know. How do you work with that? Absolutely. Um, again, Kathleen, I, I love that hunt study where they showed one hour. Um, you know, they they define sedentary as less than an hour of any really kind of recreational activity. So if people are not really doing any type of movement, I would say I want you to start walking. Well, even walking, at how do you do with walking? Um, or, or let's say they really enjoy, you know, I have some patients who love running. Um, so absolutely, I, I absolutely agree with you, Catherine, in that it really depends um, to help them with compliance and, and to really enjoy it. I mean, the point is to help them enjoy the, the movement and enjoy what they're doing. So I personally don't have a strong emphasis on one particular mode of exercise or even intensity, um, I would be absolutely, I'd be very thrilled if my patient went from not walking to walking um, several times a day. And, and one last thing, I think to help with compliance, I say, think of it as 
well, I don't want to say brushing your teeth. Some people may not be brushing their teeth, but um, let's say if you never miss dinner or, or you're always getting the mail, like you should really view your physical activity as an automatic part of your day. Um, with some of my patients who are maybe more um, at home, I'll sell them. So when you get the mail, if you get the mail every day, go ahead and walk around the block once and then maybe walk around the block twice or whatever you think would be beneficial to help you really integrate that into your lifestyle because it is really difficult and I can speak to that as well. I, I think it's really difficult to be compliant. So I think again with the exercise dose, I would absolutely agree. What, what do they enjoy or what would they like to do again? Okay, so we do have some kind of more basic questions here uh, as well, and one of the questions is at what particular point do we have a switch from M1 to M2, and what factors determine that switch? Kathy? So, that's a great question, and maybe <laughs> Peter has a better answer, but we don't have an outright time course yet, because that takes a bit of time to do experimentally, but that is on the plate. We know that the effects of exercise in the chronic muscle pain at least um, last for about a week or two. We also don't know, for instance, when the switch is back, how long once you switch them does it last. We're it might take a week or two based on your data, but there's lots of other mechanisms of action and exercise, including my relation with my nervous system. So that could be a masking to the input. We do know a bit about what phenotype. Uh, we know that we can switch phenotype from uh, M1 to M2. To phenotype. There's a lot of good work out there on that, and that's one of the main mechanisms in which we know phenotype switches, so we know that. We know IL-10 is involved in the phenotype. IL-10 not, don't show a switch in phenotype. Um, uh, IL-4 is obviously involved in the switch. So there's a lot of factors involved in the switching, but we do know some of the things that are involved. Um, there's a huge literature on phenotypic switching that you can go dig up, um, and, and that's part of um, some of our future experiments. Points after injury, um, so that was day three and day 14, and these were in rats that had run for that six weeks prior to the injury, and we actually saw an increase in M2 markers at that, that day three time point, um, and a decrease in M1, um, uh, uh, increased recovery, um, and healing um, uh, shortly after injury. But actually, later on at day 14, we saw it go the other way. Um, so we're not quite sure even what that means because these animals still have um, the attenuated behavior, um, and yet they've got um, increased numbers of M1 macrophages in the nerve. So it doesn't necessarily even <laughs> completely map onto the behavior. So I think there's still a lot of work to do there. So that's, that's kind of interesting, Peter, because when we did our, our, our treadmill running, and I'm sorry to monopolize this, but we did our treadmill running for two weeks. We actually saw the opposite. We see more M2s at two weeks, and that's kind of the same time frame you're looking at and less M1s. And we use different markers, you and I, I know, um, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe there's differences in the different markers. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. I mean, we used RAP, so we were limited in the availability of antibodies, which is unfortunate. Um, but, you know, perhaps, um, well, I, I think that the standard in the field is to use more than one marker to um, differentiate your yeah. um, polarized macrophage, so I think that's, that's important to build in, too. As I make one comment about the rats versus mice, it's maybe related. Is that um, you know when when you put it when you put your um, running wheel in a mouse cage, mice are compulsive runners and they run like crazy. Whereas uh, rats are a little bit more like humans, and some of them run, some of them don't run so much. And so there, so there can be differences in, in their running behavior that could be you know could affect the species, some of the species differences in these things as well. You know. I have a, a couple more 
some more questions here. This is a very specific question, you should probably answer fairly quickly. In the nerve injury model, where were the changes in the macrophages located? In the nerve, muscle, or sp and or spinal cord? Nerve. Uh, nerve and spinal cord. Nerve and spinal cord. Okay, good. Um, okay, can the panel exp uh, expand on the cognitive aspects mentioned at the beginning of the talk? I'm not sure. So you're talking about the cognitive fatigue that we talked about? Um, so we, don't, we haven't followed up much on that. Um, people with chronic pain, particularly fibromyalgia patients, will complain of um, cognitive fatigue. They sometimes refer to it as fibro fog. They have difficulty concentrating. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating that just a physical activity task can increase their cognitive fatigue. Mm -hmm makes me think that we make these guys exercise and then we ask them and then we want to educate them and tell them all this great stuff about pain and what to do and expect them to remember it. <laughs> Our students don't even remember the stuff when they come back <laughs> next week. How are they going to remember it? So I'm, I'm just advocating from a clinical perspective maybe writing a lot more down and um, being cognizant of the fact that we have that cognitive fatigue. I've tried to do some cognitive fatiguing tasks in animals and those are quite difficult um, and I haven't come up with a good model for that yet but we've kind of been trying to work on that a little bit because I would love to look at those mechanisms in a little more detail. But Kathy, haven't you done some of that? Uh, well, tests? we've done cognitive tests in fibromyalgia patients and, and as other people have found that particularly you know, memory tests in the face of, of a distractor, but they're particularly bad at, but I mean it's not a huge cognitive deficit, but we, and we haven't done cognitive fatigue as you, you have, but I think it's, it, it was a, those are fascinating results and it would be clearly something that needs to be followed up on. And okay, so are there another, more questions. Are there in vitro cell-based models for the muscle cells, microphage, and nociceptor cells interactions? Any, any cell-based models that you know of? So, so you're talking like a mixed culture? I, I guess, I'm not talking. I'm not reading. So I know you're reading it. I think I think I think I, I is that what yeah. you're interpreting it, it as? Right. I yeah. I don't think anybody's so, done that yet, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. that I know of. But maybe Peter yeah. knows. No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone's done it yet. But it would be pretty interesting to put yeah. some macrophages in culture with some nociceptors and yeah. see what happens. <laughs> Um, okay. We just haven't gotten to it yet. It's a great okay. idea. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. When activity was stopped and exercise-induced analgesia reversed after cessation, uh, was there an associated decrease in M2 macrophages ra make macrophage ratio? Um, don't know yet. You don't know That's yet. That's on the book. So these, okay. Yeah. The, Whoever's asking these questions seems They're to They're asking uh, all of my grant uh, questions. Your grant <laughs> question must be your grant reviewer. <laughs> okay, one more from this grouping. In the mouse studies following chronic exercise therapy and its effects on hyperalgesia, what is the gender pro profile and is, uh, this must be Jeff Mogul, I know you're there, Jeff, and what is the gender profile and is there an age factor differential also? Taking the animals used, uh, taking it okay. the animals used word. So I'll talk first about the gender profile. Um, so in the exercise-induced pain model where we electrically stimulate the muscle, combine that with two injections of pH 5, there's a huge sex difference between them um, in just the model itself. So if we look at male mice, they develop a localized hyperalgesia of the muscle that lasts for about two weeks. If you look at the females, they develop a bilateral hyperalgesia that lasts for 30 or 40 days. So much longer lasting, more widespread pain condition. In the males, it's much easier. It's in the induction of the model. So if you give the two injections right next to each other, we develop hyperalgesia in males and females. If we split those injections apart by time, say 24 hours later, only the females will develop the hyperalgesia. The males don't develop any. And if you split those two injections by space, so you give the fatigue on one side and the injections on the other muscle, only the females develop this bilateral hyperalgesia and the males do not. So there's a huge sex difference. 
turns out that we have never seen a sex difference in the exercise-induced analgesia. We have tested males and females multiple times, and it seems to work similarly across the board. Um, we're now you know, investigating what's the role for the underlying sex differences in the fatigue-induced pain model, but we're not seeing sex differences in analgesia. So this may be a good thing. It works for everybody uh, equally well, both males and females. And I don't know anything about age. These are adults. Uh, You've done only tests all adults. In adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really don't know anything about age um, mm -hmm. factors in any of these. I'm sure there must be age. Right. You've never. Fact. Nobody's done geriatric uh, rodents as well, right? I've not with not that I know of, but I think there's people looking at geriatric older older rodents and exercise effects for other other outcomes, but not for pain. Well, yeah, I, I think that's, that's right. Oh, sorry. You go ahead, Murray. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say um, that's even true for humans. Um, you know, shockingly, we're all getting older. Obviously, we're all aging adults. Um, and we did a study where we were looking at older adults over 65. And, and when you look at the literature, we didn't have a lot of literature to compare this with. So there's very little um, looking at exercise and the pain response with, with age. Uh, we did find that older adults, they definitely get hypoalgesia or a decrease in pain with exercise, um, but it seems to be a little bit less than young adults, and, and we're still trying to, to figure out why that is. But interestingly, not only is it a problem with the lack of age with the, with the rodents, but we don't actually see much literature in, in the humans either, which I find fascinating. Yeah, that's shocking considering that that's a main risk factor for chronic pain, right? Right. Uh, okay. We so do we, know that older adults have decreased levels of physical activity compared to younger adults, yes. and they also have higher levels of, phys of chronic pain than younger adults percentage-wise. So, you know, right. it would be fascinating to know whether or not that occurs. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so more questions. How is a mouse defined as sedentary? Is it simply that the animal has no access to a running wheel? Correct. So we wanted it to be sedentary like a person would be sedentary. We don't make people go on bed rest. We didn't want to make them go on bed rest. We wanted them not to be physically active uh, and to regularly exercise. So that's how we define sedentary. You could so call it physically inactive. So do they, what do they have in their cages? Do they have other things to crawl around and run over? And are they, are no. they fairly, fairly no. they're just, just bedding? That, just uh, normal, normal cage bedding, a little cage that they have, whatever their normal level of activity is. Okay. Uh, many athletes who practice regular physical exercise still suffer from so, uh, some sort of chronic pain. Can any of the immune mechanisms be altered or modulated in these groups? Where do we stop? So the great, so I tell you that um, we know that we what we're telling you is that regular physical activity may prevent the development. It doesn't prevent it forever, and it doesn't prevent all chronic pain. What I didn't show you is data where if we give a carrageenan in the muscle and cause an acute inflammation, eight weeks of physical activity has no effect on that. They still develop a robust hyperalgesia um, similar to the sedentary animals. So what we may be doing is, is preventing or knocking down the development of chronic pain. And indeed, it reduces your risk in human subjects, but there's so many factors and so many predictors of chronic musculoskeletal pain. Physical act inactivity is just one predictor, but there's so many others that you know a person could have that might set them up to still get pain despite the fact that they're regularly exercising. So I guess I wouldn't say it's a all or none, but it is a great added way to address a potential risk factor is to make people physically active. It's not the only risk factor, and I think there's a wealth of literature out there 
especially in the post-operative pain world, about predictors of chronic pain mm -hmm. and the transition from acute to chronic pain. And those are the things that we're talking about here with physical inactivity versus physical activity. Yeah. Good. So this person wants to know if you've uh, if you looked at um, uh, at any other immune cells such as T cells and in, in these pain models after exercise. I haven't yet. Um, it's it's a thought. Peter, you haven't, but are you aware of any literature that's done it after exercise? Um, I haven't either. Um, but yeah, I'm not aware for for the pain literature. Yeah, whether anyone's looked at T cells. I know that in the pain world that, yes, there's changes in, alter, in, in T cells and other immune cells in other systems in pain models, but I don't, you know, the, the people who study exercise are very few and far between in the basic science world and pain. There's a whole bunch of them that study exercise for other things, but in pain there's very few, so, uh, you know, there's not a lot of literature out there, but I think it would be great to have someone look at some of these other cell types. Good. Looks like there's lot of, lots of ideas for future grants coming out of this discussion. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, another question. Uh, do you know the gene profiling next-gen sequence of M1 versus M2 to gather more info on changes in other receptors other than CD antigens or ILs? Do I know the, say that again. Okay, do you know, you know the gene profiling of M1 versus M2 to get more information so, on changes in a... that That's pretty well published by the immune people, um, but it, it's not as simplistic as M1 or M2. There's a lot of mixed phenotypes. Um, there's some literature that says there may be 13 subtypes. There's some literature that says there may be 26. There certainly appears, and the general thought these days is that there's a continuum from M1 to M2, but there are some gene profiling you could do um, with uh, PCR and various other methods to, to get a more comprehensive view of M1 versus M2. Is that what your take, Peter? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, there's some reasonably well-accepted markers, um, you know, CD200, um, uh, arginase 1, things like that, INOS for the M1, um, that, you know, if you, you look at a couple of these markers, that would be enough to get an idea on whether they're going to be, you know, uh, pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Okay, we have a couple more, a couple of people have asked questions about um, more meditative, less physically active uh, exercise such as yoga and Tai Chi versus, you know, aerobic exercise and why, you know, there seems to be clinical reports of, of, of very good outcomes with yoga or, the, or meditation or Tai Chi and uh, what's the explanation for, uh, you know, how these work or they work differently or the same or... Well, I, I can address that a little bit. Um, you know, if you take a step back, when you think about the factors involved with how someone perceives pain, we talk a lot about the biopsychosocial model. And if you think about exercise and, and how even we could incorporate this with exercise prescription, there are, there are biological factors. Um, Kathleen nicely highlighted some of those. We've also, um, in the literature, talked about the opioid system and whatnot. There's obviously psychological factors. I mean, when you exercise, you feel better. Um, so again, we're focusing on pain management, but exercise is also excellent for people who may be depressed. Um, and then even from a social standpoint, um, I really promote um, on incorporating family members in the exercise prescription um, or doing some type of group activity like the YMCA and their arthritis type focus. Um, so again, I think that's really nice when you just, again, kind of take a step back. When we think specifically about some of those meditative therapies or even yoga, I think those could be incorporated, again, into that biopsychosocial model. Um, even from a human standpoint, we've done some research looking at sustained isometric contractions. That was a, a focus early on in the laboratory. Um, and we see nice decreases in pain when you sustain an isometric contraction. For example, holding a 25% MBC, which is one-fourth of your strength, until um, exhaustion, we can see a, a nice decrease in pain. And obviously, I'm not telling someone to just sit at their desk 
and, and um, do a static contraction, meaning you're not moving, but we try to carry that over into some of those meditative therapies like yoga, some of that sustained um, body postures can be working through some of the, the exercise type pain relief. I'll make a comment about this myself, is that, you know, there's the, both the top down and the bottom up uh, modulation of pain. And some of these may have, where, where you have changing your psychological state, your emotional state, your um, your attentional state, and some of the these uh, practices have those effects as well as the physical activity. So I think that, that there is this balance when you're changing pain uh, and that, phys that uh, aerobic exercise can also have that. So you have the direct effects at the, at the peripheral level on the muscle, but you also have changes in top-down regulation that, that yes. are incorporated into these. And there's quite a lot of even basic science evidence and more emerging that, that there's a lot of modulation in the central nervous system by exercise of P and activation of the PAG and the RVM and modulation of the cingulate cortex and uh, decreases in excitation, increases in inhibition, there's opioids and serotonin involved. I could go on. There's a lot of data on that. And so I think that these exercise and even Tai Chi and some of these others are actually working by multiple mechanisms simultaneously. And that's one of the reasons why they're so effective of a treatment. It's not like just taking a reuptake inhibitor pharmacologically. You're working on one mechanism. I, I get someone to do an aerobic exercise or yoga or Tai Chi, I'm getting them to change his immune system, to change his inhibitory control system, to reduce his central excitability, to, to have some um, cognitive relaxation and cognitive restructuring going on. All of that occurring simultaneously will have a much greater beneficial effect than a single pharmacological agent. I agree. <laughs> okay, I have a question that may be more for Marie here about the, that um, when surgeons are doing like joint replacements and th these types of surgeries and they have people starting their exercise program immediately the same day of the surgery, uh, this person is asking, is, uh, um, uh, can, what's the mechanism here? What is the current evidence on this practice? Can this uh, induce pro-inflammatory mechanisms given the trauma of surgery in itself? Is there any any thinking about this that any of you know of? I, I'm definitely not an expert on the, the post kind of trauma incorporation of activity, but um, I do think We've talked about subgrouping. I know they've done some work with, say, low back pain, um, and you know they talk about fear avoidance behaviors and and what do you do when you're experiencing maybe an acute injury? Uh, and, and not to say that surgery is an injury. I'm not saying that. And uh, 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 may, uh, again, with surgery, there's definitely some pain associated with that. And then what what how do you respond to that? So I think when you start exercise early, I think that helps to address some of that. Um, to help get people moving early on. I know they've also done some research, um, I believe even with osteoarthritis and, and um, some of the even conditioned pain modulation before surgery and how that can predict how people are responding after um, surgery. But I, I don't know a lot. I, I, I cannot address, um, for example, the immune response with surgery or how exercise may impact that. Can well, you ha have to understand that post-operative, I mean, Total knee replacement and the reason for exercise is not just for pain reduction. Um, Postoperatively, after a total knee replacement, your main goal is to improve function and get the knee to move again and get people to walk again. And that's your number one main goal. And if they have, and it will be a little bit painful to do it. Um, but there's a number of studies that have looked at people who have gotten exercise after OA and those who haven't. And they actually not having it is worse than having it. So having uh, some level. You also want to realize that what we're talking about when we start somebody on day one, we're and going to physical therapy means getting them to sit up on the side of the bed and teaching them how to contract their muscle, their quadriceps muscle, while their knee is straight. And maybe bend the knee a little bit. By day two, we're maybe bending the knee back and forth. You're not talking about having somebody do excessive amounts of what you might consider exercise. So it's a, it's a really slow progression postoperatively, but we do know that getting people involved early 
and getting them on a routine, especially in the first six weeks, has much better outcomes than waiting until their pain goes away and starting them then. And that's really predominantly for function outcomes. And we don't know whether or not it prevents the development of chronic pain a year later. Well, it'll be interesting to see if they have some more clinical studies on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Actually, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, th these models, which are kind of look like like fibromyalgia in a bit of having kind of this muscle pain, but uh, have people looked in fibromyalgia, done muscle biopsies in fibromyalgia, and did you see any of these possible changes in macrophages or anything else that would resemble this or, uh, or not? So there have been some people who have done biopsies um, in fibromyalgia. The early literature is kind of confused and doesn't show a lot of consistent results. There's some more recent uh, literature that's come out um, with Leslie Crawford has done some biopsies and looked at really fatigue markers and tends to see some changes in, in some of those. But nobody's looked at macrophages. I um, haven't been able to biopsy a muscle of a fibromyalgia patient here. Muscle biopsy seem to be hard at the University of Iowa, um, so I haven't done them here. But I would, I would like to see if that does hold true because it would right. be very interesting to see. So we don't know about a lot of that. Right, the things that they've looked for, they haven't seen changes, but they haven't looked at this. So that, that seems very no, right, no, and uh, you know they've looked for structural changes and they've looking for overt inflammation like like neutrophilic infiltration. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of that. They don't see change, loss of muscle cell types. Um, there's a few changes in fatigue biomarkers, uh, but there's not a lot. There's a little bit of change in oxygen consumption in the muscle itself, which may be suggestive of um, reasons, like there's less oxygen consumption, may be suggestive of why there's less fatigue. Oh, there's more fatigue in these guys. Sorry. So uh, Neil is telling me we only have about ten minutes left here. So maybe I'd, <laughs> oh, I'd, wow. I, I, I've been trying to get uh, some of the questions are overlapping. So I'm tr I've tried to address the main concepts. If I, I hope I haven't missed anybody's very specific question. And I guess there's probably uh, everybody could email Kathleen afterwards or the other uh, sure. panelists if they have additional yeah. questions. But do Maria, Peter, do you have anything that you want to say before we, uh, as we're finishing up, or if anybody has a question that they you know, quickly get, send in to Neil, that would be great. No, my questions actually came up with the other uh, participants, so my, my questions have been covered. Thank you. Well, I have one more, another question. Okay. I know that, that Al and Kathy Light were doing some work with um, uh, these fatigue metabolites that they were injecting into people. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, um, do you know about this and what do you think mm -hmm. about like this, this, you know, these metabolites, what, what are the important metabolites that lead to fatigue and, and related to also fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue patients and uh, do you have any, any sure. thoughts on that? Well, you know, that's kind of how we based our initial <laughs> experiments anyways mm -hmm. was that you know, Al had done these studies and shown that ATP and lactate and pH all synergize together to produce enhanced effects. And McCluskey had some lovely data on synergism between lactate and ATP and DRGs. So putting those together, they um, seem to suggest that those were key players. And then Al did this beautiful study where he took people um, and injected them with ATP, lactate, and pH at various different concentrations and found right. some doses produced fatigue and then higher doses of those produced a, additional pain response. And so it seems to be that these, oh look what I did, seems to be that these pain, um, that, that these factors seem to be important, at least these three um, seem to be important. He's also done people with fibromyalgia and he's exercised them and then looked mm -hmm. at uh, leukocyte uh, changes in uh, gene transcription of a number of different genes and, and sees um, changes in A6, sees changes in TRPV1, sees changes in, I believe, the beta adrenergic paths mm -hmm. genes as well in the leukocytes, which seems to suggest that there may be some systemic effects 
um, of acute exercise and exercise induced fatigue and pain as well. Mm-hmm. Which could also so, be, you know, be really involved if it's, yeah, and the systemic aspect of it means that it could be also related to the cognitive, it could be part of the base of the cognitive changes as well. Right, and Peter's paper has some nice systemic effects of um, the exercise tasks as well, right? Didn't you have some data in there? Yeah, um, so we're, so, yeah we're showing uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines in circulation. Yeah, and differences in the um, evoked release of from of cytokines. Yes, from exactly the right. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, mixed populations. So, yeah. So if there's these systemic effects, um, I believe that people are showing as well. It could actually have effects within the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system, and God knows what other types of tissues. Okay, I have a new question coming in from the. Outside here, one more question. We have a cluster of patients with JFM that are meeting daily exercise requirements, but with continued pain and fatigue. In thinking about M1 versus M2 macrophages, uh, might persistence of pain be explained by higher baseline M1? So whereas one person may need to work out for 20 minutes three times a week, another may need to work out 30 minutes three times a week to obtain similar results? Question mark. What do you think of that? That goes back to we don't know the dosing, um, <laughs> and we don't we don't really understand it. But the other the other thing I think you need to keep in mind is that exercise has effects on multiple outcomes, and their exercise not only can reduce pain but it can also improve function. And we have to. What happens a lot is that people kind of titrate their activity levels to a level of pain they're willing to tolerate and then they turn around and say my pain didn't change but they're now doing twice as much activity as they did two months ago or three months ago or six mm-hmm. months ago so you have to really be looking at what outcome and kind of balance are they are they still you know doing more activity and then you have to actually point that out to your patient and then they go oh really look at that I, I can move my head all the way around now and I could only go you know, I couldn't move it before. Or, you know, they they start to see that as I am doing more, but you have to tell them, otherwise they think their pain has remained unchanged. Because they and keep exercising they until pain. they get a certain level of pain, but that amount of exercise is increasing all the time. <laughs> right, a slow progression of activity levels, mm-hmm. and you don't realize it because, you know, you'd rather be active than sitting on your couch. I think most mm-hmm. people really do want to get off the couch and do more activity. And I think there's a lot going on here in addition to the M1, M2 macrophages as well. Um, so uh, Todd Vanderer and um, um, it was Philip Milan a couple of years ago published a paper showing um, engagement of descending uh, modulatory systems um, with exercise and that they could actually block the anti nociceptive effects of exercise if they um, administered the new opioid receptor antagonist naloxone um, uh, centrally. So there's, there's also um, exercises engaging these other uh, central systems as well as in addition to some of these um, uh, peripheral immune effects. Okay, so now I have a, a strong need to get up and go exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so Neil, I don't know, I think we're, we, we've pretty much gone through all of the questions and uh, exhausted, uh, cognitively exhausted our panel. <laughs> yes, I think so. Um, well, thanks for turning it back to me, and uh, I just wanted to thank everyone. Kathleen, thank you so much for a great talk today. I wanted to thank our panelists, Peter and Marie, and, of course, and our moderator as well, Catherine, for a great panel discussion, and wanted to thank all of our attendees listening in and for submitting your questions. In addition to all the great questions we got, we also received a lot of comments saying wonderful talk and great discussion. So I think this has been a fantastic webinar. Just one final note is that we'll have a recording of the webinar available within the next day or two on PRF. So if anyone would like to listen again, or if you have colleagues who might like to listen but couldn't attend today, you can access the recording shortly on PRF. So. We hope you enjoy the webinar today. I wanted to thank again everyone for attending, and we hope to see you at the next webinar, which will take place in December. It will be on December 12th on the topic of cancer pain and the mechanisms of cancer pain, and we'll be sending out some more information about that shortly. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay.